In the 13th year of this century, on the 25th of December, the birthday of Christ, in a square on the edge of Vienna, there was a painter selling postcards. Staying in a cold room without heating, in a hotel on the same square, was a Russian revolutionary. One of the men was Schickelgruber, Adolf Hitler, the other was Joseph Stalin. Who would have believed then that these two men would several years later decide the fate of the planet? No one could have foreseen that barely 20 years after the meeting that never was, Hitler and Stalin would preside over warring ideologies. Their final struggle would tear Europe apart, lead to the deaths of millions, and reshape the political landscape of the whole world. They were dedicated to each other's destruction, yet each seemed to need the other. They studied each other's careers, respected, even admired each other's cruelty, and used each other to further their own ambitions. In a century of bloodshed, Hitler and Stalin stand out in dreadful symmetry, as beacons of evil. Beyond the events that shaped them, did it take a special kind of personality to do what they did? Were the 20th century's greatest enemies, in some fundamental way, the same? Both Hitler and Stalin were outsiders. They came from the far reaches of the great empires into which they were born. Both were later disdained as provincial, vulgar upstarts, and both spoke with strong regional accents all their lives. Joseph Stalin was born in 1878 in Gori in the Republic of Georgia, deep in the Caucasus Mountains, where he's still a hero, despite having turned his back on his native land. He was born Joseph Dugashvili. Stalin, Russian for Man of Steel, was the revolutionary name he took in 1912. While no trace remains of Hitler's birthplace to discourage unwelcome pilgrimage, Stalin's childhood home is still a shrine, encased in a marble facade with a museum next door. Proof, as Stalin said, that victors are never judged. Pilgrims have come in their thousands to pay homage. A house in Gori, the great Stalin, leader of the working people of the whole world, was born here and lived in this house. From all over the Soviet Union, from all corners of the world, people from different countries come to this spot with a message of love and gratitude. Joseph Stalin was the son of a cobbler. As a child, he suffered from smallpox, which scarred his face for life. His left arm was withered, the result of an early accident. He grew to be only five foot four inches tall, something he was to hide with platform soles. Stalin grew up in a violent household. A childhood friend wrote, Undeserved and severe beatings made him as hard and heartless as the father was. Since all people in authority seemed to Stalin to be like his father, there soon arose in him a vengeful feeling against all the people standing above him. Adolf Hitler, ten years Stalin's junior, also had a far from idyllic childhood. He was bright but lazy and loved to dream of a life of adventure and excitement. From an early age, he devoured books about war and soldiering. Hitler's parents are buried in Lumbach in Austria. Their grave is tended to this day. His father, Alois, was a customs official. He wanted Adolf to follow him into the civil service. The boy was horrified telling his father he wished to become an artist. Artist? No, never as long as I live, was the reply. Like Stalin's father, Alois Hitler terrorized his family. Der Vater war tatsächlich doch ziemlich gewalttätig und hat beide Buben aus den Halbbrüdern... His father was really very violent tempered and used to beat and hit both boys, Hitler's half-brother as well. 
It is clear that Hitler had an extreme aversion to his father. It was his mother Clara whom Hitler loved passionately. He carried a picture of her with him until his death in the ruins of Berlin. She pampered him as a baby and spoiled him as he grew up. Hitler said of her, she lived only for her husband and children. They were her entire universe, but she gave a son to Germany. When he came to power, Hitler declared the day of her death the day of honor for the German mother. In 1939, Hitler, Chancellor of Greater Germany, revisited the scenes of his childhood in Austria and the school he attended in Fischelham. In later years, his childhood became tremendously important to him. Hitler used his past to explain what he had become. He said he had been a natural leader of boys and a gifted student. In fact, as an adolescent, he failed badly at school and was twice held back because of poor grades. In 1905, his father dead, Hitler dropped out of school in Linz to fulfill his dream of being a painter. His mother used her pension to support him as he affected the life of the romantic artist. Stalin's mother, Ekaterina, was less indulgent of her son, but just as devoted, sending hampers of Georgian delicacies to him until her death. When Stalin once complained about her beating him as a boy, she replied, that's why you turned out so well. She wanted him to be a priest and sent him to a Russian Orthodox seminary. It was to change him forever. He owed a very, very great deal to his mother because ever afterwards in his life, he was literate in Russian. He thought in systematic terms as the church had taught him um, to do. And he always kept in touch with this lady, even when he was in Moscow. He always expressed himself very lovingly towards his mother. He was a very emotional man. In the repressive atmosphere of the seminary in Tbilisi, the Georgian capital, Stalin grew politically aware. I became a Marxist on account of my humble upbringing and the rigorous intolerance and Jesuitical discipline that crushed me so cruelly. Instead of the Bible, he read smuggled copies of Marxist pamphlets. And instead of Christianity, he embraced the new communist faith. His daughter Svetlana was to say that it was here that he came to believe that men were coarse and intolerant and that they lied and intrigued. In 1899, age 20, Stalin was already involved in underground communist activities. He left the seminary and dedicated his life to revolution. It didn't take very much to push someone into objecting to the social and economic conditions in which most people had to live in that empire. But few would-be revolutionaries became quite as committed to authoritarianism, to hierarchy, to discipline, to class war, to revenge of the poor against the rich, as did Stalin. Stalin had all the brutal commitment of a terrorist. He robbed banks, incited violent demonstrations, and beat up his opponents. He was arrested and exiled to Siberia seven times. He later described his time in exile. I hung around mostly with criminals. I remember we used to stop at the saloons in town and drink up every kopeck we had. The criminals were nice salt-of-the-earth types, but there were lots of rats among the political convicts. In Siberia, Joseph Stalin developed the characteristic which was to be one of the essentials of his rise to power, absolute self-sufficiency. He relied on no one but himself, never sharing his inner feelings with his comrades. A good dose of exile in Siberia never hurt me, he later said. Out of exile for a time in 1905, the wary, watchful provincial radical met the man who would transform his fortunes, Lenin, the Bolshevik leader. 
Lenin was immediately taken with a rough Georgian. Stalin appealed to Lenin for a variety of reasons. Firstly, Stalin was one of the few obviously very able uh, organizers of the Bolshevik party within Russia. Stalin had a lot of experience in revolutionary underground uh, work. And it was quite natural that Lenin, looking around for uh, people who could be entrusted with responsible uh, functions within Russia, uh, selected Stalin. Hitler had no such sense of direction. In 1908, he left the small town Austria of his youth and arrived in Vienna to try his luck as an artist. The years that followed were for him what exile in Siberia was to Stalin. I owe it to that period that I grew hard, he later said. Although Hitler saw himself as an artist, his talent was limited. He applied twice to the Viennese Academy of Arts. Twice he was rejected. It was a bitter blow. When I received the news, he said, it struck me like a bolt from the blue. Hitler squandered his mother's inheritance loafing around in Vienna. He spent much time in the Austrian parliament, mainly to keep warm, but also to drink in the rabid nationalism and anti-Semitism current at the time. What he witnessed there gave him a lifelong contempt for democracy. The failed artist sank fast and was forced to seek shelter in a home for vagrants, still open today. It was a crushing humiliation. Shy and solitary, he sat in the same corner of the writing room day after day, drawing and painting. He never had a real conversation with anyone in the hostel. When he opened his mouth, it was to make a speech, loudly, passionately, speaking down to people and carrying on as if he would never stop. The other people in the hostel would laugh at him. He was a peculiar figure. He was an extreme example of a loner who nonetheless read a lot and learnt a lot. In winter, Hitler took work shoveling snow, but lacked the coat and the strength to carry on. His destitution didn't do what it had for so many other poor and hopeless men in Vienna and drive him into the arms of the Marxists. Instead, he developed a horror of communism, believing that a man must succeed by his own efforts. To that end, Hitler tried to make a living selling his paintings of Vienna as illustrated postcards. His partners in this doomed enterprise were mostly Jews. In dieser Gesellschaft in this kind of atmosphere, he quite clearly latched onto the Jews. He developed close friendships with them and worked together with them. This, however, had nothing to do with his ideology. He had quite clearly learned the slogans of the anti-Semites in Vienna more or less by heart. He had a phenomenal memory. He didn't just learn these slogans by heart, he learned an awful lot else. The outbreak of war in 1914 was a turning point for Adolf Hitler, who, in contrast to Stalin, had grown into adulthood a drifter. In August that year, he was captured on film by the photographer Hoffmann in Munich, his new home, rejoicing at the declaration of war. He rushed to enlist. I am not ashamed to acknowledge that I sank down on my knees and thanked heaven for the favor of being allowed to live at such a time. Hitler was a regimental runner, taking messages from trench to trench, often under heavy fire. Twice wounded, once gassed, he was awarded the Iron Cross First Class a high distinction. The war changed him forever. It created an extraordinary moral blunting, I think, in Hitler. He saw death all around him. He had friends who were killed um, every single day. Uh, I think it, it created in him almost a, a desire to steep himself in the atmosphere of, of, of death and, and destruction. And I think we can see very clear links between 
that extraordinary environment uh, and his willingness later on to embrace uh, policies of annihilation. I learnt that life is a cruel struggle and has no other object than the preservation of the species, Hitler wrote. For him, morality had no place. Only the survival of the fittest, the German master race, would matter now. Joseph Stalin, unlike Adolf Hitler, did not fight in the First World War. He was rejected by the Russian army as unfit because of his damaged arm and as a political troublemaker. Freed from military service, he pursued his political ambition. He had a clear sense of his historic role, a revolutionary working alongside the party leader, Lenin. In 1917, he went to St. Petersburg after the overthrow of the Tsar in the February Revolution. He took over Pravda, the Bolshevik newspaper, and moved into a flat with the Alleluia family. In those days, in contrast to Hitler, Stalin was relatively relaxed with women. The daughter of the family soon caught his eye. It was here, in this flat, that his romance unfolded with Nadezhda, Aleluyev's younger daughter. In time, she was to become Stalin's wife. Nadezhda was 16 when Stalin arrived at the flat. They married two years later. She was a music student and appealed to the Georgian revolutionary's romantic side. I know that she loved Tchaikovsky mainly, those children's pieces of Tchaikovsky. The girls were also very fond of Byron's poetry, and so in one of the rooms they hung a portrait of Byron. Stalin, too, loved Byron's work. As a young man, he had published his own romantic poetry. When the mountain spring, dammed up, once more sweeps the path away and gushes, and the forest, woken by the breeze, begins to toss and rustle, then I, too, oppressed, find the mist of sadness breaks and lifts, and instantly recedes and hopes of the good life unfold in my unhappy heart. Joseph Stalin and Nadezhda Aleluyeva fell in love. Lenin, who had come to value Stalin, was disappointed. Lenin said to Stalin, I want you to marry my sister. Stalin said, I'm sorry, but I have already married Nadezhda Aleluyeva. What, said Lenin, how? Just like that. How did you find the time? Stalin replied, we somehow found the time and got married. Despite the failed marriage bid, Stalin's intimacy with Lenin grew. He had hidden the Bolshevik leader in the Alleluia flat before the October Revolution and helped him escape to Finland. Once there was a time where they had to escape. The police wanted to catch Lenin and shoot him as a spy. Granny said that he had to be shaved so as to disguise him, and she wanted to do it. But Stalin said, I'm a man, I'll shave him better. So he did it, and put a cap on Lenin like the one I'm wearing now. Grandpa gave him a coat and took him to the station. On the 24th of October, 1917, Lenin returned by train to St. Petersburg and took personal charge of the revolution. Stalin had failed to grasp the pace of events and throughout this crucial period spent his time behind his desk at the offices of Pravda. Later feature films rectified this blemish, placing Stalin at Lenin's side throughout. On the 26th of October, 1917, the Winter Palace, the final bastion of the provisional government, was stormed. In the civil war which followed, Lenin relied on Stalin to do his dirty work. There were no moral thresholds for Stalin. 
And Lenin knew about this. He promoted Stalin. He knew what sort of person, or he thought he knew what sort of person he was. He gave him all of the dangerous troubleshooting roles after the October Revolution in the Civil War. If there was a problem on one of the Civil War fronts, the man to send there was Stalin. As Lenin's enforcer, Stalin seemed to have found his role. It was only in the chaos following the First War that Hitler found his. Germany's defeat in 1918 was a devastating blow for him. He heard the news while in hospital after being gassed. I had not wept since the day I stood at my mother's grave, but now I couldn't help it. What was all my pain compared with this misery? Defeat now gave Hitler the strongest characteristic he was to share with Stalin, an overwhelming sense of political mission. Hatred grew in me, hatred for those responsible for this deed. In the days that followed, my own fate became known to me. He took Germany's defeat so personally. I mean, many people did, of course, feel, feel a, a sense of personal loss. Um, but Hitler, having drifted so long in his early life, suddenly had this extraordinary desire, I think, to marry himself to Germany, his German history and to Germany's future, uh, and gradually began to develop the idea that he alone was able to bridge this divide between this sort of sense of personal, deep personal loss and the salvation of Germany. Hitler, like millions, sought scapegoats everywhere. He blamed Marxists, Jews, democratic politicians. He was Germany's misery made flesh. In 1919, he found a home and a voice in the extreme right German Workers' Party in Munich. From the very first, he electrified with his oratory, despite his Austrian accent. He had always suspected he had a talent for rhetoric. Now it was confirmed. I could speak, he said. He began in committee rooms and beer halls. The effect was always the same. Goodness, he's got a gob on him, the leader of the Workers' Party said. We could use him. My father heard Hitler speak for the first time in a Munich beer keller in 1920. My mother told me that he came home in high spirits. He was usually depressed, but had shaken off his depression. He said that he had met the man who would lead Germany to greatness once again. Spellbound by Hitler's oratory, many thousands joined the fledgling party, and in less than a year Hitler had made it his own. He used all his artistic skills to create the party's image introducing the heraldry of the swastika and the array of banners and symbols which would later reach their apotheosis at the Nuremberg rallies. He translated his own bitterness into the party's ideology, railing against enemies within and without, socialists, communists, Jews and capitalists who had worked together to destroy Germany. And he insisted on complete obedience to himself as Führer, the leader. Hitler was Nazism and Nazism was Hitler. It was an extraordinary transition for the man who only ten years before had been a homeless wastrel. But Stalin and Hitler, of course, were outsiders. Uh, Stalin was a Georgian and Hitler, of course, was an Austrian. A point, I think, that is so often overlooked when one talks about the impact of Hitler on Germany. But they were, in, in that sense, like Napoleon, outsiders who had something to prove. Um, they cut themselves off from their roots. Um, and in that kind of rootless situation, had to tie themselves to something else. Stalin tied himself to Lenin's revolution. Uh, Hitler tied himself to the salvation of the German people. By 1923, Hitler was confident enough to try to seize power in Munich by means of a putsch, a violent coup. It was a fiasco. As Hitler and his stormtroopers marched into the Odeonplatz, they were fired on. Contrary to later Nazi propaganda, Hitler fled, suffering a dislocated shoulder, and took shelter in his press officer's house. He took out a pistol and said, they shan't take me alive. And my mother then slowly talked to him, Herr Hitler, you can't do that. 
Think of all the people who have believed in you and still believe in you. You cannot leave them in the lurch this way. And having talked along this line, she got up to him and quietly took away the pistol and dropped it into a great bin of flour. Hitler was imprisoned in Landsberg jail near Munich. Once again, he suffered intense depression after the failure of the putsch. But his sentence gave him the opportunity to set out his personal vision in a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. It tells us a great deal, not just about Hitler's geopolitics or his racism, which is well known, but about Hitler's general view of human nature, his view of the political process, his view of, of what makes societies work, how they hold together. Uh, there's no blueprint in Mein Kampf, but the, the general worldview that Hitler sketches there dominates his thinking right the way through to the Second World War. Stalin, meanwhile, already had his hands on the levers of power and was seeking to tighten his grip. But in a world where Lenin was the star, he had to veil his ambition, unlike Hitler, who made a virtue of his craving for power. Lenin appreciated Stalin's mixture of cunning and ruthlessness. That cook, he said, will concoct nothing but peppery dishes. The skills Stalin showed in dealing with party matters led to his appointment in 1922 as General Secretary of the Communist Party and put him in a position where he could build his power base, especially when Lenin's health failed. In his office in the Central Committee of the Party, Stalin was able to quietly select the right people, people who would be indebted to him for their positions, and put them in places where they would be useful to him. In 1922, Lenin suffered the first of several strokes. Stalin had hidden his ambition so well that Lenin only now began to recognize him as a rival. Why on earth didn't Lenin having picked Stalin to do all of these jobs that required so much um, confidence, so much ruthlessness, not tumble to the possibility earlier that those qualities might be used against him. And I think the only conclusion you can draw about this is that Lenin was too arrogant to, to, to see this possibility. He never guessed that anyone that he had promoted would ever be able successfully uh, to turn the tables on him, but Stalin did. Paralyzed, Lenin dictated his last testament to his wife, in which he attacked Stalin for being coarse and rude, and for abusing power. Many of Lenin's comrades now saw the war commissar, Leon Trotsky, not Stalin, as the obvious successor. In January 1924, Lenin suffered his final stroke and died, giving Stalin the opportunity he had been waiting for. Now he could begin his campaign for supreme power within the Communist Party. He set himself up as the high priest of the new cult of Lenin. At the same time, he singled out his rivals for destruction. But to seek mastery in the world where all men are equal required from the first his special gift for inscrutability. He always had this sort of mask at funerals. The mask was such that it was impossible to work out what he was thinking. His mask was always one and the same. He didn't smile. It was a face of stone. By his facial expressions, one couldn't tell if he was upset, happy, or enjoying someone else's misfortune. Stalin was bitterly aware that he lacked charisma. He had none of Hitler's mesmeric powers when he spoke in public. But he was supremely skilled at the game of politics. He singled out Trotsky, his arch-rival, who had the presence and power of oratory he so lacked, and plotted his downfall. Trotsky was able to speak beautifully and to speak magnificently in public. He was a very talented orator. Stalin's genius in achieving power lay in his remarkable ability to get one group of people to destroy the other. 
He began with getting the members of the Politburo to turn against Trotsky. Trotsky was driven out of the Politburo and expelled from the party. He was destroyed. After the destruction of Trotsky, Stalin would turn against those in the Politburo who had helped him and destroy them too. Stealthily, but with absolute ruthlessness, the General Secretary of the Communist Party built up the complete and arbitrary power that has scarcely been equaled in modern times, except by one man, Adolf Hitler. In January 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, not as he wished, as an outright victor at the polls, but as head of a coalition government. The task he had faced on the journey to power was very different from Stalin's. Stalin had manipulated a party and organization in place. Hitler had to create his from nothing. But like Stalin in Russia, many had underestimated the Fuhrer, who used the same measure of cunning and manipulation to gain his ends. Germany's conservatives believed that once Hitler was in power, they'd be able to control him. They were as wrong as Stalin's comrades had been. Hitler was a populist politician with a lot to prove. Uh, he didn't want to be yet another conservative. He wanted to be something radically different. Uh, within a matter of two or three years, of course, he demonstrated uh, to the conservatives that they would have profited a great deal by reading Mein Kampf. Wenn wir sagen, dass in Deutschland mindestens 20 Millionen Menschen zeugen, at the core of Hitler's power lay his ability to speak. Hitler's oratory connected him to the people and touched the wellsprings of their emotion. As a follower wrote, Hitler responds to the vibration of the human heart with the delicacy of a seismograph or wireless receiving set, enabling him to act as a loudspeaker, proclaiming the most secret desires, the sufferings, and personal revolts of a whole nation. Before starting a speech, Hitler would feel the mood of the audience. An orator, he said, receives continuous guidance from the people before whom he speaks. It was the combination of the build-up of emotion, together with Hitler's theatrical gestures, that gave the speeches their intense power. Hitler's speeches might have appeared spontaneous, but they were in fact carefully calculated. The speech having ended, Hitler, Goebbels and my father, of course, and I went into Hitler's office. And here he was, half an hour later, 35 minutes later, perfectly rational, recalling the effect that some of his statements had had and instructing uh, Goebbels uh, to uh, bring into sharp relief certain parts and leave others out and so forth. I thought this was quite extraordinary. <laughs> Stalin's hold on power had little to do with his public speaking. Stalin had a number of political talents, among which we can't really include oratory. To the end of his days, he spoke with a thick Georgian accent. Uh, he spoke with a lack of fluency. He did, however, had a sort of genial demeanor at party conferences. <laughs> but 
it's inconceivable that he could have stood up at a Nazi rally as uh, Hitler did and rouse people to their feet. Once in power with his rivals dispersed, Hitler was confident of his position. Unlike Stalin, he rarely felt seriously threatened by those close to him and was loyal to his henchmen to the end. Indeed, he only purged one senior member of the Nazi party, Ernst Röhm, the leader of the stormtroopers, who was shot in 1934, along with 80 or so of his associates. It was a pragmatic move by Hitler to widen his support amongst the middle classes and army. He was a revolutionary, and that's the right to purge the party. They do it everywhere. The so admired French Revolution was purging continuously and killing people, about 30,000 with the guillotine. No? So in compared with that and what happened in Russia, uh, Hitler was a Sunday school man. Stalin was now supreme in Russia. Like Hitler, he had all the powers of a dictator. And like Hitler, he used them to impose an intensely personal vision. For Stalin, it was modernization. Nothing and no one was to stand in the way of its achievement. Stalin always envisaged that the best quick route to a political solution was through a physical solution. If you've got a social group that's giving you trouble politically, eliminate it physically. Ideologies need their enemies. Hitler's were outsiders, Jews, Marxists, gypsies and homosexuals. Stalin's were his own people, against whom he waged war in the name of the state. He regarded the Russian peasantry especially the richer Kulak smallholders, as rural capitalists holding back the revolution. Millions of peasants were uprooted from their homes and forced into collective farms and the new industrial cities. The result in the Ukraine, one of the most fertile regions on earth, was starvation. Four million are now estimated to have died. Such people, like Stalin, there was no in the history of humanity. It was a in the history of mankind, there's never been anyone like Stalin. He was a devil. He wasn't a human being, nothing of the sort. Not even during the Inquisition, the reign of Nero and so on, was there anything on the same scale of cruelty and perfidy. Stalin believed his drive to modernize the economy justified his claim to be the heir to Lenin. In a series of five-year plans, he set impossible goals. The building of vast capital projects, canals, dams, railways, and the creation of entire new industries. Russia was brought into the modern age, but the advance was only made possible by slave labor. Stalin built the Gulag, his vast network of labor camps on Lenin's foundations. The Solovki archipelago northwest of Archangel was the site of the first camp. It was set up many years before Hitler's concentration camps. Hundreds of thousands were held in this former monastery and its surrounding camps, many of them deported kulaks from the Ukraine. They labored on Stalin's roads and railways and his pet project, the White Sea Canal. For those who entered here, there was no hope. Prisoners began their lives without provisions or tools, often even without shelter. Many would have died from cold in the first month. Originally, the prisoners had the possibility of working hard so as to cut their sentences. But then Stalin suggested that prisoners who worked well should not be released from the camps. In effect, the terms gradually began to increase. If at the beginning a prisoner was given three years, the terms were then increased from five to ten and up to twenty-five years.
The images of Stalin's gulag are less familiar than those of Hitler. Yet, with their watchtowers, barracks and barbed wire, they mirror the Nazi concentration camps. Both systems took a terrible toll of the camp populations. But the gulag Stalin began at Solovki was to last for more than half a century and end only with the fall of communism. The history of the Gulag is the history of the country, and Solovki became the cancerous cell from which the whole tumor of the Gulag stemmed. The Solovki guards were later put in charge of many camps throughout the whole country. Stalin's war on his people took a devastating toll and corrupted his own personality. He spent much time in the Kremlin, working or watching films, one of his few means of contact with the outside world. He became more and more isolated from the people he ruled. In the early years, his marriage had been relatively normal. But as time passed, his wife Nadezhda, always independent-minded, became upset by his brutal methods. You're a torturer, that's what you are. You torture your wife, she said. You torture the whole people until they can take no more. In November 1932, after Stalin drunkenly insulted her in public, she returned home and took out the gun she carried for her personal protection. She shot herself in the heart. She didn't spoil her face. And so she lay in her coffin as if she were alive. She looked very beautiful. When Stalin saw her, he said, she left like an enemy. Stalin forbade any mention of his wife's suicide and destroyed her final note. He did not attend her funeral nor visit her grave. The marriage of Stalin to Nadezhda Aleluyeva was a real tragedy. And when that marriage ended with her suicide, really Stalin became a very cold, frigid man who, um, in revenge for any kind of slight towards him, was even harsher than he had been before. Hitler's relationship with women could be equally destructive. He was both possessive and dismissive. His first love was his niece, Geli Raubel. It's unlikely that Hitler ever had sexual relations with her, but when he learnt of an affair she had with his driver, he exploded in rage. Geli was forbidden from seeing other men and pursuing her career. In September 1931, she shot herself in the heart with Hitler's handgun. He was devastated. It was an extraordinary parallel with the death of Stalin's wife. What it showed, I think, were, were men who um, found it extremely difficult to commit themselves to others. and People were desperate to get something back from these figures. Uh, but they were, in a sense, married to history, married to their mission. They were married to the outside world. I think they had much less to give to people in personal relationships, and they suffered for it. Eva Braun, who worked as an assistant to Hitler's photographer, became the Führer's female companion for the rest of his life. She was responsible for the home movies taken at Hitler's mountain retreat, the Berghof in Berchtesgarten. She did everything she could to gain his attention, even once attempting suicide herself. She was 17 years old when she met him first time, and he was 23 years older, and he adored her, and she was uh, happy to have a man who adored a little girl. It was no normal relationship. Hitler, like Stalin, kept his private life a secret. He hid Eva Braun from the German people. He told Albert Speer, within her hearing, that a highly intelligent man should take a primitive and stupid woman. He described his own female ideal as a cute, cuddly, naive little thing, tender, sweet and stupid. Hitler had no family. Yet he had a rapport with young children. And he could be charming just as Stalin could when it served his purpose. But with adults, he was always aloof. 
Quite unlike Stalin, he was a teetotal vegetarian and a militant non-smoker who disapproved of raucous behavior. It was often said that he preferred the company of animals, a reflection, perhaps, of his disregard for human life. I remember we went to look at the wonderful new buildings and what was planned, and Hitler adored this situation. And he was with Speer, was present, of course, and they made plans and so on. We saw a man was coming, and he said, I have a wish. And I said, well, tell me, what is your wish? And then he said, free beer for me and my friends. And Hitler, then he was annoyed, and he said to his ADC, well, organize that he, this man gets his free beer. And after dinner in Berchtesgaden, they started a discussion of whether animals have feelings and intelligence. And he had a wonderful dog, a Alsatian dog. He liked very much. And then he said, when I come home and the, my dog sees me, he is so glad. I know that he has a feeling. But this man today, he asked me beer. You see, this man has instinct, a human being, but my dog is better than the human beings like this man. And he was very much upset. Hitler hated the petty routine of ruling. Unlike Stalin, he refused to read long state papers. At the Berghof, he would rise late and often do nothing all day. It was as if the mind-numbing routine of his private life was used to build up reserves for his manic obsessions the pursuit of war and conquest, and his triumphal public appearances. Adolf Hitler was energized by the adulation of the people. It was his lifeblood. It was when on the podium addressing a rally fully immersed in the cult of the Fuhrer that he seemed to find and reinforce his true identity. and he seemed to satisfy a deep-seated emotional need in the Germans. He was a vessel into which they poured their own national longings. For his part, the cult of the Fuhrer, symbolized in the theatrical displays of power at Nuremberg, gave him identity and utterly convinced him of the supremacy of his will. Hitler was a showman. Hitler liked it when his arm was stretched out. During the rallies, he would simply stretch it out like a brilliant dancer. He liked to appear on the screen in the evening in front of the people. He liked these huge parades and auditoriums. But Stalin would sit in his Kuncevo dacha and he would work and work and work. Joseph Stalin was always on his guard. Working alone at his Kunstvo Dacha, at his desk day and night, he was nicknamed Comrade Card Index. He showed a diligence which Hitler lacked completely, and that was the key to his power. As time passed, his paranoia increased. He became distrustful of all those around him, even closest colleagues and friends. Aware of how effectively he had dispatched others, Stalin put faith only in himself. In 1934, at the 17th Party Congress, Stalin's suspicions focused on his old comrade, Sergei Kirov, the leader of the Leningrad Party. Kirov was everything that Stalin was not. Charismatic, handsome, warm and outgoing, popular in the party, to make matters worse, he opposed the pace and methods of Stalin's revolution. Stalin was a concurrent. Stalin considered Kirov to be a rival and was afraid of him because of his popularity among the people. At the 17th Party Congress, in the elections for the General Secretary, 
Kirov won. Stalin faked the results, but Kirov wasn't really trying to become general secretary. And he went back off to Leningrad and worked there. Ten months after the Congress, Sergei Kirov was assassinated in Leningrad. It is still unknown whether Stalin was responsible, but Kirov's death gave him the excuse he needed to start his great terror. Stalin ordered a full state funeral for his former friend and appeared as the chief mourner. His daughter later wrote, When the facts convinced my father that someone he knew well had turned out badly after all, this was where his cruel, implacable nature showed itself. The past ceased to exist for him. Years of friendship and fighting side by side in a common cause might as well have never been. More often than not, he used to be burying his own victims, who were killed according to his orders. He had this principle. He used to say, if there's a person, there's a problem. No person, no problem. Stalin's show trials began. Disagreement with the leader on any issue, however trivial, had become a capital crime for which there was only one sentence, death. Former friends and associates of Stalin confessed under torture to the most extraordinary crimes. Confessions which they then repeated to Stalin's notorious prosecutor, Andrei Vizhinsky. Stalin never forgot uh, those who had opposed him uh, in the past, and he settled scores with them. The show trials are the classic example of this. The, the show trials were also an important means uh, of uh, propaganda, of convincing the Soviet public that there really were uh, enemies everywhere, even at the highest level of the party. The state prosecutor, Vizhinsky, and his victims were reading from a script. Stalin had carefully stage-managed every last detail of the charade. He even had a secret vantage point from which he could follow the proceedings and seems to have taken a sadistic delight in the humiliation of his victims. My idea of a perfect day is to plan a beautiful revenge on an enemy, carry it out, and then go home peacefully to bed. Yeah. I believed in this, as many other people believed. There was belief in Stalin then. It had to be either or. And at that time, you could either believe in Stalin and not doubt, or not believe in Stalin and become one of those people who were sent to prison and shot. It was not a difficult choice. Stalin personally signed execution orders for 41,000 men and women. But there were many more victims of his terror in the 30s. Millions of Soviet citizens were arrested, hundreds of thousands of whom were shot. By 1939, there were more than two million who had been transported to the camps, many of whom died. Hitler's actions in this period pale by comparison. His horrors were still to come. In the Soviet Union in the late 30s, Stalin, unlike Hitler, rarely mingled with the masses. He had a paranoid fear of assassination. Stalin was remote but ever present in the people's lives, a godlike figure, all seeing and all powerful. He was called Vojd, the boss. When his mother had asked him what he did, he told her, I'm a bit like a czar. Certainly, the people saw him as such. It was a curious combination of deathly horror and naive credulity on the part of the people. Most believed in him as they would their own father, the wise leader of the people, and so on.
народов и так далее, и так далее. Adolf Hitler was also at the height of his powers. In the spring of 1938, his troops marched into Austria, bringing about the union of Germany with the country of his birth. He too had become a god, a mythical figure for his people, always more popular and separate from the Nazi party he led. But unlike Stalin, it was his spellbinding physical presence which captivated the masses. Hitler and Stalin were absolute masters in their own domains, and as the balance of power in Europe shifted, they began warily to circle each other. I have read a book on Stalin, Hitler said. He is a tremendous personality who took the whole of that gigantic country firmly in his iron grasp. Both dictators were very aware of the other. They gazed at each other across Europe. Uh, they wondered uh, what the other was like, what made the other tick, what was his grip on his people like and a few glimpses we have both from Hitler and from Stalin show that there was something like a mutual admiration between them and they both respected the fact that they had come from very humble backgrounds and had triumphed against all the odds to lead the great powers. Following the annexation of Austria Hitler continued to expand the Third Reich. In 1939 he began to eye his next target Poland. In a move of supreme cynicism but calculated logic, so typical of both tyrants, the two opposing camps now locked in a deadly embrace. In the summer of 1939, Hitler sent his foreign minister, von Ribbentrop, to Moscow to sign a non-aggression pact with Stalin. The advantages were clear to both. Hitler was free to attack Poland, and Stalin, weakened by a purge of the military command, gained time to build up his defences. Ribbentrop wanted a preamble to the pact outlining the mutual respect of the two nations. Stalin refused. After six years pouring buckets of filth over one another, it's too late to expect our peoples to believe all is forgiven and forgotten, he said. After the signing, he told his staff, I know what Hitler's up to. He thinks he's outsmarted me. But actually, it is I who has outsmarted him. Events were to show how wrong he was. The pact with the enemy plunged the world into war and sealed Poland's fate. A secret agreement between the dictators divided Poland between them. For those living under the new regimes, there was little to distinguish one from the other. A terrible symmetry emerged between the two occupied territories. Am 18. Tage des Feldzuges trafen sich bei Brest-Litovsk die deutschen Truppen mit den aus Osten anrückenden Formationen der Sowjetunion. Stalin attempted to do the same thing that he'd already done in Russia. He deported the Kulaks, he shot intellectual and political uh, leaders, and he Sovietized the country. Similarly, Hitler, in moving into Poland, set about an even more ruthless extermination of the Jews, eradication of the Jews, than had already taken place in Germany. to take place in early summer. All the while, Stalin was convinced that Hitler would not attack, despite the intelligence he was receiving. 
When the war began, he didn't believe reports saying that Hitler's army had approached the border from Murmansk to Odessa. That couldn't be hidden. There were reports from spies, ambassadors and deserters. He didn't believe anyone. Paradoxically, he only trusted one person, and that was Hitler. When Stalin was first told of the German bombing of Russia, his response was confident. Hitler knows nothing about it for sure, he said. What is needed is urgently to contact Berlin. He soon learnt the awful truth. Hitler's betrayal was to throw him into turmoil. He retreated to his dacha and did nothing as German forces advanced. Even after the war, he would shake his head and say, together with the Germans, we would have been invincible. It took Stalin some time to recover his composure. On the 30th of June, 1940, he returned to the Kremlin and took charge once more, addressing the Russian people. Now that the two dictators were at war, their utter conviction and absolute ruthlessness would ensure a new type of war and lead inevitably to genocide. This really was a titanic struggle. Both sides came to see it that way, a struggle to the death between two colossal historical figures. And the two figures, of course, who um, were determined in the end to win at all costs, all human costs, um, the, the struggle very quickly assumed a level of extraordinary brutality and barbarism. Adolf Hitler remained supremely confident of victory as he visited his troops close to the Eastern Front. He regarded the Slavs as subhumans to be exterminated and believed that the whole communist edifice was rotten to the core. He told the Italian dictator Mussolini, I feel spiritually free again. Partnership with the Soviet Union seemed to me to be a break with my whole origin. I am happy now to be relieved of these mental agonies. But the strategy was misconceived, a product of Hitler's hubristic belief in his own omnipotence. The German forces were ill-prepared for the Russian winter. They became overextended in the vastness of the Soviet territories and the Führer's policy of a race war against Jews and Slavs meant that he failed to gain the support of many in the Soviet Union who hated Stalin. As the tide turned against him, Hitler observed Stalin's strength partly lay in his readiness to take measures nobody else would consider. Stalin is half beast, half giant, he said. To the social side of life, he is utterly indifferent. The people can rot for all he cares. 25 million Russians perished fighting Hitler. Stalin could always say to Hitler, as it were, you lose a million, we'll lose a million. And we'll do this right down to the bottom line. And in the end, we're bound to win because we can afford to lose more aeroplanes, more tanks than you can. We can afford to lose more factories than you can. In the end, there won't be any Germans left, but then there'll still be lots of Russians left. And that was the way this man fought the war. Even when the war was clearly lost, Hitler himself had no qualms about genocide. The extermination camps in the East continued their murderous work. After the defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler withdrew from public gaze, and his relationship with the German people weakened. Failure made him a diminished figure. Das ist der Schauplatz des verbrecherischen Anschlages, den ein kleiner Kreis gewissenloser Offiziere am 20. Juli auf den Führer und auf den Stab der Wehrmachtführung verübte. In July 1944, a bomb detonated under a table came close to killing Hitler. He retreated further from view. Like Stalin, he had a deep fear of assassination with reason. There were 43 attempts on his life. 
200 of those who plotted to kill Hitler were arrested by the Gestapo, interrogated, tortured and put on trial in the Berlin People's Court. It was Hitler's version of Stalin's show trials. The People's Judge, Roland Friesler, had learned his trade in Russia, where for a time he'd been a Bolshevik. Friesler used the same abusive and bullying style of cross-examination that Stalin's prosecutor, Vizhinsky, had employed in the show trials. Hitler ordered that no mercy be shown, adding, Friesler will take care of things all right, he's our Vizhinsky. Two hundred were sentenced to death, five thousand were sent to concentration camps. The leading plotters were executed by slow hanging with a piano wire noose attached to a meat hook. Hitler, it was claimed, watched a film of the execution, but there's no evidence of this. Contrary to popular belief, neither he nor Stalin had a stomach for the many cruelties that they inflicted. I think if Hitler had come face to face with that reality, if he'd been taken on a tour of the ghettos and concentration camps, he would have found it extremely difficult to confront. Uh, Stalin too, of course, uh, found it very difficult to confront the reality of the horrible war he was waging. He made one brief staged visit to the front. Um, it lasted only a matter of hours, uh, and he scurried back to, to Moscow um, to make sure that he wasn't exposed to any personal danger. As the Russian and Allied forces came ever nearer to Berlin, Hitler ordered his staff not to negotiate with Stalin. If I settled with Russia today, he said, I'd only come to grips with her again tomorrow. I just can't help it. Whereas Hitler consistently ignored the advice of his generals and overrode uh, them, uh, Stalin learnt from his mistakes. There is a dialogue between him and his generals uh, which proves more and more fruitful. Uh, and ultimately, of course, the Soviet Union uh, wins its great victory and destroys uh, Nazi power um, on the Eastern Front uh, and plays the largest part in uh, the military defeat of the Third Reich. In March 1945, the Führer appeared for the last time in public as he gave bravery awards to Hitler Youth in Berlin. The strain of war had aged him prematurely. He seemed much older than his 56 years. One month later, Russian soldiers advanced through the ruins towards Hitler's bunker. In his final testament, Hitler had no gratitude for the German people whom he had led to destruction. Instead, he acknowledged the Slavic people as the new master race whose resilience and fighting power had brought them to the gates of Berlin. On the 30th of April, 1945, he committed suicide with Eva Braun. He was a very broken man. I don't think it was hard for him to die. I saw Hitler slumped against the door, slumped by the table, and Eva with her knees drawn up lying next to him on the sofa. The body of Adolf Hitler, wrapped in blankets, was taken out of the emergency exit and placed in a bomb crater. Petrol was poured over him and he was burned. Bis zum letzten Atemzuge gegen den Bolschewismus kämpfend für Deutschland gefallen ist. When Stalin heard the news that Hitler had shot himself, he exclaimed, Now he's done it, the bastard. Too bad he couldn't have been taken alive. With Hitler dead and the war over, Stalin was more powerful than ever. Товарищ Сталин, 
the cult of personality reached new heights. The people genuinely revered Stalin as the savior of his country in the fight against fascism. He was called the dear leader, the great helmsman, and the universal genius. But the destruction of the arch enemy, Nazism, led to no softening in Stalin's attitude. The labor camps continued to expand, and he remained as paranoid as ever. As one colleague said, a man goes to Stalin as a friend, but he doesn't know where he will be sent next, home or to jail. Wives of colleagues and members of his own family were now sent to the camps or even shot. And Stalin remained as obsessive as ever about the smallest details. The phone rang. I picked it up and heard, please hold the line. Shortly, Comrade Stalin is going to speak with you. I stood up, or more to the point, my own legs forced me to stand. A few seconds later, I heard that familiar voice. He did not greet me, but got straight to the point and said, yesterday, Comrade Zhdanov spoke to you about a certain cartoon. The Cold War had started. Stalin ordered a cartoon lampooning American plans to station troops in the Arctic. But he was unhappy with the caption and inserted his own words. To understand how Stalin, with the global scale of his affairs and his work and his power, still managed to find the time to change the text underneath my picture is astonishing and incomprehensible. In 1949, the Soviet Union celebrated Stalin's 70th birthday. Despite his murderous cynicism, he still craved the worship and adulation of the masses. The deification continued. Khrushchev, who was to succeed Stalin, described him then as even more capricious, irritable and brutal. His suspicion, he said, grew to unbelievable proportions. Stalin's appearances in public were now rare and carefully stage-managed. He gave up making speeches, desperate like Hitler, to hide the ravages of time and the strains of leadership. The similarities with Hitler continued. He became infected with a paranoid anti-Semitism, born of a resentment against Jewish intellectuals. Measures were taken against Jews in all walks of life. He was a very ruthless man. And when people were giving him a problem, perhaps an ethnic group such as the Jews, he tended to turn to uh, very drastic measures. And there's good reason to think that he was about to deport all the Jews from Russia and Ukraine into eastern Siberia. As Stalin grew older, he became lonely and desolate, fearing death always. Like an ancient tyrant, he insisted that all food be tasted before eating. Khrushchev overheard him mutter to himself, I'm finished. I don't trust anyone, not even myself. Stalin spent more and more time closeted in his dacha, watching his colleagues make fools of themselves as they drank and danced into the night. He was as feared as ever. So much so, that when he suffered a stroke on the 28th of February, 1953, none dared approach him or call a doctor for nearly 12 hours. His death was agonizing and prolonged. Despite Stalin's crimes, his death came as a hammer blow to the Soviet people. Many seemed almost to believe in his immortality. Like Hitler, Stalin left no successor. Like Hitler, he believed none worthy to come after him. Before his death, he had said to the party, you are blind like young kittens. What will happen without me? The country will perish. To this day, despite his tyranny, Stalin retains a place in the heart of the Russian people. A strong leader, who brought order and industry to the country, and who, in the words of the poet Pushkin on Peter the Great, 
raised Russia on its hind legs with his iron curb. But the dark stain of brutality remains. It was a difficult and unimaginable time of suffering, and to remember it is difficult. How could we suffer so much? But we suffered. How we suffered. Hitler and Stalin still cast their long shadow over the modern world. Many millions died this century under their rule. Of the two, Hitler remains the more obvious personification of human evil. Stalin is still judged less harshly. The true scale of his persecutions and cruelty have only recently emerged. And for some, there remains a crucial distinction between the ends to which the two dictators worked. Stalin was, unlike Hitler, uh, never uh, in favour of a specific policy of genocide, of wiping out an entire people as an act of state policy. Millions of people did die under Stalin, but most of them died of starvation, mistreatment, overwork. They were sent to camps, of course. Uh, but Hitler and the regime uh, set out deliberately to isolate, discriminate against, and finally to exterminate whole groups of people on the basis of a, a warped biological, historical view. And they did so, of course, fully conscious of everything they were doing. But perhaps the final judgment owes less to comparisons between the scale of the dictator's wickedness and more to the shared roots of their evil. Both men early on wiped their hands of human compassion. One death is a tragedy, said Stalin. A million is a statistic. Conscience, Hitler remarked, is a Jewish invention.